Welcome to Breaking the Silence of Design, a bi-monthly vodcast designed to discuss the issues of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in the built environment. My name is Karen Compton, and I am your co-host and founder of A3K Consulting. And I'm Gabrielle Bullock, your, your other co-host and principal and director of global diversity for Perkins and Will. And today we are joined by my dear friend, founding principal of Fabric in Pasadena, and member of the faculty at Cal Poly Pomona's Center for Environmental Design, Nina Briggs. Welcome. Thank you. Nina is a graduate of the School of Architecture at USC. She has taught architecture, interior architecture, and landscape architecture for a variety of universities, including Cal State Northridge, Woodbury University, and the Art Institute of Los Angeles. She is the definition of a scholar and an educator, and we welcome and welcome perspective to, in this discussion. Welcome. Thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you. So I'm going to dive right in. You created a course at Cal Poly Pomona called Justice Escape. And first of all, I want to know why did you create it? And second of all, why did you feel it was necessary? What is it? What is the course, and how is it necessary? Well, I wasn't planning on creating a course, uh, but our students wrote an open letter uh, in May after George Floyd was murdered. Uh, and they wrote an open letter to the faculty with a list of demands. Uh, some of those demands included um, more representative faculty, um, and a rehauling of the curriculum, basically, to include the erased histories and resources for um, the built environment. And simultaneously, I had been reading everything I could get my hands on um, about critical race theory and anti-racist uh, ideals as related to the built environment. And there have been these uh, reading lists floating around among academics and professionals and everybody. I read as many reading lists as I could. Uh, and we'll talk about that too because <laughs> you have a lot of reading lists. Yes, and I realized that reading the books, reading the reading lists was not going to be enough mm -hmm. if all of those things are not contextualized if the dots are not connecting. And especially as an educator, um, in order to relate uh, racism and its consequences to what I teach, there's a, a lot of dots that need to be connected. Uh, so again, not intending to create a course, and because I am a visual learner, I created a a map or a data visualization of all the topics and subtopics um, about racism and policy and law and how they relate to the built environment and started connecting the dots so that I could understand um, how much racism and white supremacy are embedded in our on all our systems. Mm -hmm. um, and I showed it to a colleague, and she said, this is a class. So you originally did this for your own personal edification and understanding? Yeah, I, I am not a race scholar. I am you know, an architect, a practitioner, an educator. Uh, and I think we're all undereducated on the history of this country. Uh, and so I was really trying to educate myself. I was fascinated by what I was learning. Um, and it, it, I, needed to make, I needed for it to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it was suggested that my process be made into a course. And at the same time, it satisfied one of the student leadership group's demands. So what's the course? Tell me about the course. Tell us about the course. And how it's been perceived so far. Well, 
The course uh, is open to all students in the College of Environmental Design. So that's architecture, landscape architecture, art, and urban design. And I have students from all of those disciplines who signed up for the course. Um, it is literally connecting the dots from policy to the built environment and everything in between. Uh, I believe that we are to teach students how to design our futures, but they can't do that if they don't understand our past and how the built environment is actually made. And so I think that's a really key piece that's missing from design education. Um, we teach students how to design. We give them theoretical and sometimes real life projects. But we don't talk very much about uh, the process towards getting something built. Um, and so that's really what the course is about. But I thought it would be important to set up kind of a rules of engagement. So I wrote a manifesto um, so that we could have difficult conversations, uh, but engage each other with respect mm -hmm. and empathy um, and patience. Uh, this is a fraught time. Uh, we are teaching uh, on Zoom. The students are scattered all across the country. Some of them are even outside of the country. Um, they, they are anxious, sometimes depressed, um, fearful about their futures, uh, as we all are. This is a fraught time. And so I wanted to create a safe space for um, not only for the students to talk about their concerns about uh, this racial reckoning and you know among the pandemic and in an election mm -hmm. year and and the loss of normality uh, but to help them connect the dots how's it been perceived I think that was one of how's the class been received um, first of all how long have you been teaching it it's this is week six. Oh, okay so you enough to get a perception I imagine uh, I think it's mostly positive, at least from the students. I um, invite my colleagues, the other faculty members, to attend as well. Uh, I created a website uh, for the course uh, because there's so much information. Um, the website is becoming almost like a living database mm -hmm. um, because I felt the need to call all of these resources that I spoke about earlier, the books and uh, the reading lists and, and organize them in, in categories then that can be easily accessed. Mm -hmm. um, so I believe the response is positive just uh, by the number of students that have enrolled in the class uh, and uh, my faculty is supportive. Uh, so, we'll see. Well, good for you. Stay tuned. Okay, next question. So we've talked and texted, texted it, texted, emailed and I am <laughs> <laughs> brought a variety of perspectives presented by authors such as Isabel Wilkerson's cast that explores the misconceptions of racism and Angela Davis's freedom Freedom is a constant struggle that I believe you read. Yeah. On intersectionality, how do justice and anti-racism intersect with architecture and landscape architecture? More importantly, how do we begin to address it, address that in the way in which we teach? Okay, so that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> I said it was the next question. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> well, first of all, um, Intersectionality, I think the phrase was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Uh, and I think that she developed in intersectionality um, as part of radical feminism to include 
uh, women of color uh, in feminism. And I think that she derived uh, some of those concepts from Angela Davis. And so I'm a little sensitive to the term inter intersectionality uh, and making sure that Kimberly Crenshaw gets credit for developing the theory. Uh, and also people are using the word intersec intersectionality, sometimes not understanding its origins and applying it. Um, more broadly. Yeah, more broadly. So um, I, don't, I wouldn't use intersectionality um, too much uh, with the Justice Scape um, course. Um, but when we look at how the built environment has been made, um, how we build our infrastructure and our cities and our homes, um, the point is to understand the various factors that go into that. So for example, one of the assignments, um, the students had to kind of create almost a mathematical equation, um, citing historical legislation and uh, today's laws or policies mm -hmm. that are essentially kind of an upgraded 2.0 version mm -hmm. of what has always been in place and to trace the history of those evolving legislations. And when you look at it that way, um, you understand exactly why our cities look the way they do. So the intersectionality of that is that, for example, um, Jim Crow laws and uh, segregation um, are inextricably linked with voter suppression and home ownership, um, social mobility, and some upgraded versions of that would be redlining. Mm -hmm. And that is linked to the real estate industry and our banking systems uh, and uh, environmental injustices. And then you go a little further uh, towards today, and we have gerrymandering and uh, gentrification mm -hmm. and voter suppression again. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's, it's less about intersectionality, but finding the thread that links all of these intersecting topics uh, together so that we understand what has not changed. Right. Sort of like connecting those dots for your students in your, in your class. Exactly. And you said it's almost like a mathematical equation because you start with the beginning of policy 100, 200 years ago and then look at it going forward. With each kind of iteration, it's cleaned up a little bit, for lack of a better word or whatever is palatable in that time. Right. And then we respond, if I understand you correctly, um, through design to whatever that policy is at that particular point. And then we evolve to the next level and keep doing that, as right. opposed to really stopping and deconstructing and saying, wait a minute, why are we doing what we're doing? And is this right and is it just? And recognizing the same injustice in an updated version and calling it out. I think that's incredibly important. I think sometimes, and we've had this conversation, we don't always necessarily call it out. We might recognize it, but it's not necessarily collectively called out. And I know that's one of the things that we've been trying to raise the conversation around. Well, yeah, so when you look at the voter suppression that has happened in the southern states in the last few months, it may not be the same exact uh, methodology that, that happened after Jim Crow when black people were asked to guess the number of jelly beans in a jar in order to qualify to vote, but the intention is the same. So it would appear that we're on a journey to kind of construct, deconstruct um, anti-racist behavior and not sure that we're all going to reach the destination, but we're all going to certainly enjoy the journey. 
I recently heard one of my colleagues, and we've actually had this discussion offline, I actually heard one of my colleagues say, some people aren't necessarily going to want to go on the journey, but we can shame them into going. And I stopped and thought about that, and I thought, that's probably not the best approach. I'm curious as to what, is, what are your thoughts about getting people to go along on this journey to deconstruct and construct how we teach, how we bring people along, how we foster people in this process? Well, shame is not an effective social justice tool, period, in, in my opinion. And that's one of the tenets of my manifesto. Um, because shame makes people feel like they don't belong, um, that they don't deserve to be part of the conversation. I think it's ineffective. Um, by the same token, I am not trying to make anyone see anything. That is not my job. People have to come to these uh, understandings on their own. Uh, I was exceptionally curious about all of this, and so I investigated. And the people who are curious about it are investigating with me. Um, I don't believe you can change hearts and minds, and that's not my purpose. I can only change myself. Um, but that's what I love about teaching, because it is possible to create, I hope, a safe space in which we can all explore these concepts together, um, arrive at our own conclusions, respect one another, one another for our differences in opinions or perspectives, um, but go on into the profession doing what we can. How do you want, I'm curious for both of you, how do you want the profession to come along and support you? I mean, we're all sitting here kind of representing different facets. You're on the academic side, you're on the larger corporate side. I'm curious as to how you would envision. Well, you know, I think that what, what you're curious about and how you're teaching your students around this topic and how I'm trying to foster a more diverse and inclusive and just profession, mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it's because it's all about humanity, mm -hmm. right? This is, I said, I think I said it on the very first um, mm -hmm. episode of this, this is not rocket science. It's about humanity. So if we're designing the built environment, designing for communities, why wouldn't we want to be curious and understand how communities have been impacted by our design approach, by our educational approach. So I too, I mean, I am trying to bring folks along, yeah. but I can't make them come along. Yeah. yeah. I think we're all trying to make people, not make people, but you, I, we want to bring them along. If they want to go on the journey, if they want to go on the journey, we want them to come along. <laughs> Final thoughts, Miss Nina. <laughs> I think it's also t um, important, at least to me, to question nomenclature. So the language that we use to describe each other, um, the labels that are put on us, I think need investigating. So um, diversity, inclusion, equity, I ask my students, what does that really mean? Mm -hmm. um, a person, him or herself, cannot be diverse. <laughs> I am not diverse, I am you know, just who I am. But also being called a minority. Um, if we look at the world population, people of color are 89% of the world population. So minority? Um, BIPOC, yeah, what does, what does that really mean and who came up with that label for people who are black, indigenous and, and peoples of color? So it's, it's really just about questioning everything. What does that mean to you? 
that's my way of bringing people along, as, as you say. I, d I do think it's interesting that you bring up the word minority, because I think the choice of that word is used oftentimes to minimize someone or their contribution or who they are, not because they are less represented, which is how the term often gets utilized. Or that it's, it's become the go-to word mm -hmm. by certain people. I do not use that term. Yeah. I do not like that term. I don't think it's representative of, um, of anybody. And so I try not to use it, but it's become the go-to word. So every time I hear it in any of these conversations, I raise that issue, right? So I, I agree with you that we should think about the words we use because words matter. Language is very powerful, as Toni Morrison used to say, uh, mainly because we internalize those words, all of us, uh, and how we see ourselves um, is more important to me than how other people see us. I want my students to um, arise in, an, in a new kind of dignity, uh, knowing who they are after questioning terminology. One of the assignments that they had to do was they had to go to their parents or their grandparents and ask about their family histories and legacies. And then they had to study what dignity means. And um, after having those conversations and, and asking questions, they discovered things that they either had forgotten or hadn't been discussed before. And then they, I asked them to take a, a Renaissance or 19th century classic bourgeoisie painting and Photoshop themselves into it um, so that they can reclaim uh, their family's legacy of dignity, that they can find the pride and the dignity in those humble backgrounds, um, rediscover the honor of of their families uh, and, and realize that caste does not define who you are. And in fact, the definition of caste uh, as it was constructed in this country uh, was meant, as you say, to debase people. And so it's really about looking at every single word, policy, law and deconstructing it and stripping it of its power. I appreciate you for coming. We appreciate you for coming. We appreciate you for giving us some language in which we can talk, not just academically, but within our firms. So I want to thank you for, for joining us today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And I want to thank IBI Group, who was our sponsor for this program and for this journey. And I thank all of you, I really do. And I wanna thank you too, Nina, and I wanna thank our followers, our subscribers, and you can continue the dialogue on Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And join us next time as we continue the uncomfortable conversations with our next guest. Thank you.